So, good afternoon everybody and a big welcome from ICAS. A bit of a rainy day, but a warm welcome to, I believe, almost, well, just north of 200 of you out there. So, in our series of webinars, here we are again, ICAS Insights. We've had about 30 plus webinars now, and many of you are regular attenders. You know that we've got 23,000 members out there. Many of you dialing in today, particularly in Scotland today. Uh, and amongst our membership, we have had a series of conversations on different themes. And, and today, I'm absolutely delighted that um, Kate Forbes, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, has accepted an invitation to speak to you. Uh, Kate, Kate's had a rather rapid rise over a very few years, Kate, far, far lesser years than I've got, but actually, um, starting out, well, formative years in Dingwall, and, and I also read a little bit of India in Glasgow in there as well, so India to Dingwall, there's a story in there, I'm sure. Um, and actually, a historian by background, Edinburgh and Cambridge Universities, and, and, and then a little dibble into the world of accountancy, which we might return to, came into accountancy, went into politics, I reckon then now you're clearly back in a sort of finance role, but I have to say when I, when I look at your resume of um, subject matters you've covered, Kate, in your time in the Scottish Parliament, uh, it's, it's wide and far, just to, to mention some, Land Reform Act, uh, Rural Economy, Connectivity Committee, Sports Committee, and, and leading on now to, to finance. Um, as well as that, I, I believe you're the first person that's given a speech in 100% in Gaelic to the Scottish Parliament. Um, I could challenge you to do that this afternoon, and there will be one or two Gaelic speakers on this call, but the majority is, are not. So, so if you want to burst into Gaelic at any time, feel free, but not too much. Uh, Kate, at this moment, I'm just going to ask you if you'd like to sort of talk to our members about 20 minutes. Um, some of the themes we talked around was that how is it for you in terms of your role, the ongoing COVID-19 support from the Scottish Government? Um, how does it feel like coming out of this? And the question that, that we collectively have to be involved in, and probably the most important one, because it's not a political solution only, is how do we collectively support and grow the economy coming out of this so that we're a more vibrant Scotland. So Kate, over to you. Thanks very much. Well, thanks so much for having me. And uh, speaking in Gaelic is a tactic that I have used on occasion when I don't know the answer to a question in the hope that fewer people understand my answer. So, but grateful to join you today. And I thought I'd just set out very briefly some, some comments at the outset and then keen to get into Q&A because I think that's probably where the more interesting discussions will be. But I'll talk probably about three things. One is just a bit of an insight into Scottish Government's response to COVID. And then two other areas I think have been flagged up through the, the process. What, the second is the way that governments work together within the UK on the fiscal side. And then thirdly, as we look ahead to economic recovery, what that looks like and I think that the theme throughout is just the importance of this being a national endeavour which may sound like a cliched comment but I think has never been more important of government working very collaboratively and closely with uh, experts, businesses, those that are on the front line in terms of the economic response and I know that there's previously been conversations with ICAS and others about how we together support the Scottish business community and uh, ensure that our economy is growing and I think that relationship has got to be even stronger and obviously since Covid hit we have all worked and lived through very challenging and unprecedented times and it's been a time where government has had to be flexible and move away from being focused on process and focus very much on solutions and outcomes and I've had a duty to ensure that our fiscal policies protect Scotland's economy as much as possible and of course the public discourse will always focus on the outputs they will always focus on the spending decisions they will focus on the small business grants or how we're funding PPE or whether there's enough uh, nurses and doctors in our health service and they are all important but none of it can happen without the work that I and my team have been doing to ensure that we balance our budget. The Scottish budget is fascinating because it is a fixed budget. We cannot create immediate headroom through borrowing, for example. 
And so in light of that, I have been dealing with, for the most part, and it'd be good to go into more detail later on, but dealing with estimates and dealing with consequentials, because of course the primary source of our income is still the UK government. Now, estimates may be manageable when you're talking about millions. They get pretty scary when you're talking about billions, which is what we've been doing through this crisis. And having to turn decisions around within the space of hours sometimes, whether it's the, the business support package, 2.3 billion pounds, when you've got a, a fixed budget, uh, which is, you know, is if, if you look at our most recent um, budget revision of about 50 billion pounds, these are, these are big figures, but they are based on treasury estimates, which can go up or down. And all of that has been part of my job in the last few months to manage in order to ensure that the other announcements can be made on business support and on things like PPE. So certainly a lot has changed since I unexpectedly delivered the Scottish Government's budget in February. I think in the aftermath of that immediate uh, sort of step up to this role and being required to give a budget within a matter of hours, I received a lot of congratulations. I think in hindsight, commiserations might have been more appropriate because to have to deliver a national budget within a matter of days and then a global crisis and now one of the most significant economic crises of uh, our lifetimes um, has been uh, has made for a, a challenging but fascinating few months and you know since since the beginning of, of the crisis the focus has been to counter the pandemic to deal with the, the health impacts but also to recognize the different harms that were being done that there was yes of course the harm of coronavirus directly but there were also other harms and there was no easy simple solutions to balancing those harms the obvious economic harms the wider health harms the societal harms and those harms will leave a mark they will leave a mark for years to come and so our initial response to the crisis and in trying to mitigate the harms has now become dealing with the legacy of those harms, particularly as we start to ease our way out of lockdown. And broadly speaking, for those that follow politics and those that follow the, some of the um, uh, more uh, interesting political uh, developments when it comes to Scotland within the UK, I've been quite clear from the beginning that I've welcomed the action taken by the UK government, but often felt it hadn't didn't go far enough and it didn't suit our particular needs as a country. As I said at the outset, because the Scottish Government does not have the full suite of necessary fiscal powers at our disposal, it's often meant that we are working very hard to use the limited information we have to turn it into policy decisions and announcements. And I thought I'd give you a uh, an example that you'll you'll understand and, and you'll appreciate and it's the example of LBTT. So obviously at the Chancellor's summer budget update he announced uh, changes to stamp duty and immediately there are repercussions for the Scottish economy. So although it's devolved the repercussions are that the housing market was waiting to see what the Scottish Government would do. So I was under enormous pressure understandably and rightly so to stand up the next day within 24 hours to indicate what the Scottish Government was going to do. And I had to do that knowing full well that we hadn't had the months or even the weeks to put the legislation in place and to make sure Revenue Scotland were ready. And therefore I had to make the announcement knowing that I couldn't give an immediate date for when it would be implemented. And that is, that is hugely problematic as you will well know. But it was the lesser of two evils and the second issue was making that decision not knowing what funding would be coming to us because the initial uh, block grant adjustment estimate was then revised down by the OBR um, quite considerably. So that illustrates, I think, one of the central challenges that I and my team have faced on the fiscal side for moving quickly to make substantial investments on the basis of estimates 
that can move considerably and have repercussions on the Scottish economy. And I think the challenges we face around LBTT is a good example where, you know, perhaps advance notice. Now, it was trailed the weekend beforehand, but there was no indication, we certainly don't give, uh, get advance notice of what the Chancellor is intending to do on something like stamp duty. And, and yet it does have a, a profound impact and you then have to choose the lesser of two challenging approaches to try and uh, provide that certainty quickly. And, you know, I, I think that way of working is unsustainable. I think that way of working, which has been highlighted through the crisis, per, but perhaps we had already had a sense of, is unsustainable. And it's something that certainly is one of my priorities for how we ensure that our fiscal powers allow for a more sustainable approach to governance and to tax eh, and spending decisions and happy to revisit that in some of the q and I think one of the challenges and that's where I'm really keen to work closely with organizations like ICAS and otherwise is that it's such a complicated and complex picture and there is a a lot of it is so new in terms of the evolution of the fiscal framework and the devolve, devolution settlement that there's a lack of understanding in the public domain for some of these things and I think you see that with the particularly with the fixation on, on income tax, the fixation on um, a, a very uh, narrow um, uh, suite of powers on, on income tax. So as we look ahead, I, I said earlier that we now focus on dealing with the legacy of the harms, the health harms, the economic harms, and the other harms. And our recovery proposals have got to be ambitious, but they've also got to be practical and they've got to be sustainable. And where we don't have the powers, we've been calling for the UK government to be ambitious in its response as well. And whilst government has a key role to play in ensuring a sustainable economic recovery, I think there is an opportunity to work more closely in partnership with Civic Scotland, with businesses to do that. Our purpose, our remit has been to protect people and businesses as best that we can. But as my counterpart uh, and Chancellor has said, uh, there, is, uh, there are limits to, to government's ability to do that. And that's where that partnership working and that collaboration is so important. And, uh, you know, engagement between the Scottish Government and the accountancy profession is important at the best of times, but this is an especially critical moment and I'm keen to continue that uh, engagement, to listen to critique, to listen to constructive comments, to listen to guidance and advice and suggestions and solutions. Because in the last few weeks, and I'm sure it's the same for a number of you, we have had to take unprecedented action uh, in these extraordinary times where it's been solution oriented. It's not always been perfect, but it's been a case of moving quickly in order to save businesses. So keen now to get into the Q&A, but I suppose the three questions I would leave with you for response now, but perhaps to consider and to um, respond to in, in your own time, and I'm always happy to receive emails or otherwise, is, you know, firstly, what your outlook is for, for business and their finances for the remainder of this year and beyond. And how do we support businesses to be in a more sustainable place? What are the structural changes that have perhaps removed markets, not just temporarily, but will have changed markets in the long term? And how can we collectively support those businesses? The second one would be, what are the opportunities around tax that COVID presents us with? You know, in terms of our, our, our interventions on tax, particularly to take on domestic rates, 100% relief this year. Well, there's questions there about what we, what we do next year. And the, the reduction in VAT, I would certainly be very supportive of seeing that uh, reduction made permanent, particularly for the hospitality industry. And then the third one would be that having just got through a budget, it hardly seems that long ago, we're already planning for next year's budget. And next year's budget, again, the Scottish Government in this process of seeing the fiscal framework and the devolution settlement evolve will face for the, for the second time, 
some very substantial say, tax um, reconciliations um, on top of COVID and on top of an end to the transition period uh, for Brexit. So we have uh, a lot of uh, issues to contend with and the budget will play a key role in providing that certainty and stability to see us through it. So I'll pause there, hand back over to Bruce okay. and thank you. Well, well, thank you for that, Kate. And um, gosh, I've, I've got a few questions myself. I'll just say to the audience that there is a Q&A button rather than the chat button. And I can see some questions coming in already. So if you've got a question, please press on your screen, the Q&A button, and you can type in your question. And, and, and I'll probably pick them up as groups as I see them coming in. But, but Kate, no, thank you for that. And just a, a very simple opening question. Um, I thought it was a bit of an understatement when you said you took on the job at short notice and then we kind of went into a crisis and then we are actually probably in the biggest recession in recorded history of 300 years. So, so you have arrived at a most interesting time. Uh, in terms of, of you kind of starting your career in that accountancy, and I appreciate you moved away from it, but has it given you a benefit and understanding of the role you're doing now? It's been invaluable. And I would say that for two reasons, actually. The first is that whatever else you look at, your training to be a chartered accountant is probably one of the most valuable forms of training, I think, in the world, because of the, the, the sense it gives you uh, for, for figures, for, for business, for, for, for the economy. And so that, that training, even if you know, I, I don't go around calling myself a chartered accountant, uh, but that training um, has been eval invaluable and I still call on that. And I think you know, I'm very grateful for all those long hours and no weekends and losing all my friends for three solid years. So um, that's useful. I think the second element, which you may not appreciate as much, is the focus on ethics. So in, in politics, you know, politicians come and go. We don't always have the best reputation uh, globe, uh, in, uh, out there in, in the public domain. Um, but you know, a, a, an accountant's, prof accountant's career or profession stands or falls on the basis of ethics and ethics alone. Now, there's all the other elements that you build on top, but all those other areas are mm. utterly redundant without that ethical framework. And you know, that was a clear obvious part of my training and in in politics where there's temptations to uh, present things in, in in different ways and of course you know you can present things in all manner of different ways when it comes to comes to the figures but that focus on ethics i think is still an anchor for me at least um, and so on those two fronts i wouldn't have traded those those years of training for for anything the ethics actually is, is, is a very interesting point because obviously we we've all been through the training and, and we've seen that and actually now we're in a position where um it's actually examined and, and some people say well can you examine ethics and we've demonstrated you can and you can have a debate around can ethics be taught or is it we certainly believe it can be taught and it is um coming to one of our other sort of core subject matters um you'll be aware that icas has just put together a paper called the future of taxation in the uk and, and, it, and it was it was underway before the crisis, but I think you mentioned yourself the the crisis itself has has demonstrated inequalities for sure, and and, and actually we all knew the inequalities were there, but they're very very obvious and in your face now. We we can see the way that the crisis is playing out. So really, ICAS is saying, is it about time, or it is about time? We had a wider debate: the purpose of taxation, the fairness of it. Do you think the crisis, will, I mean, are, are we, can we have a more mature conversation now because about social responsibility and the obligation to look after the wider society and pay tax? Yes, and I think there's a particular Scottish dimension to that, which I'll come on to. But in terms of the, the general point, I agree. So in my job, all my colleagues get the credit for their announcements on spend. They get to announce the exciting new projects that are happening in education and the X millions that are going on uh, all sorts of different areas. And when it comes to the budget every year, that is what people are fixated on. They are fixated on the, the nice, shiny announcements in the budget. What they're not focused on is where we get it from. 
And, you know, again, I think that that's most clearly seen in the Scottish budget because it is a fixed budget. You know, I don't have access to alternative uh, sources of revenue bar uh, some of the devolved taxes and uh, UK government consequentials. So it demonstrates just how critical it is to make that money go as far as possible. And I think that, again, largely because of the way that the devolution settlement and the fiscal framework have evolved so recently, there is a complete lack of, um, in, uh, I, I don't want to say a complete lack of intelligent uh, debate, but I think there is a problem with our debate in the public domain uh, about the, the, the fiscal levers that we have and how we put our public finances on a sustainable footing. And it's largely because of the complex nature of it and because mm -hmm. perhaps, I don't know, you, we've lost, there's some great journalists out there, but we've maybe lost some of the subject specialists when it comes to writing about these things. And again, I, I, I get enormously frustrated when we fixate solely on income tax in Scotland as though that is the only source that now it's key in, in Scotland, that there's a complete lack of understanding of how we do fund um, our, our spending commitments. And I would like to see that change. And it's got to be led by experts. You know, it's got to be led by professionals like yourselves who have that independent, respected voice to inform, educate, raise awareness. And the last point I'd make is one of the things I was keen to do in the last, last year's budget, but will definitely be uh, doing more of in this year's budget, is every year we have roundtable meetings with industry and with professionals and, and tax experts. And that's good, but it's just tax experts speaking to each other. What about those that are coming to me asking for more money on equality measures or on welfare measures? I want them to be at the table talking about tax as well and making sure that our stakeholders are much broader, that the stakeholders that are asking for spending commitments are also the stakeholders that have an opinion or are talking to me about where the money comes from in the first place. And so I think, I think, you know, on those three points, I think raising awareness and informing the debate, making sure that professionals like yourselves have a role in doing that because of your independent, respected voice. And thirdly, making sure that the stakeholders we are engaging with are not just your usual suspects. So, so actually, that is interesting because, uh, yeah, obviously, often the, the finance director is cast in the role of the person that says, no, we can't afford to do that, or we can afford to do that. But... But I think the point you're making there is it is about choices and it's making informed choices where the people spending the money are also those saying where does money come from. And, and I know you don't want to feature too much on income tax, but um, it's, it's, it must be difficult because a fair, a substantial element of the Scottish population are not in that income tax bracket. And compared to maybe the UK, there's, there's only so many higher net worth individuals at the higher level of tax. So, that presumably gives you a lack of flexibility. You know, there aren't, yeah. there aren't so many people with strong, broad financial shoulders that can help out. I mean, the first issue with income tax powers is the way in which they've been divvied up. Because, I mean, in what planet does it make sense to have control over rates and bans, but not over the personal allowance, not over gift aid, not over any of, of, of the other allowances? You know, you are setting income tax policy with one hand tied your behind your back. And if you, uh, last year or so, I was trying to give a bunch of German MPs, and they obviously have a, a, a very federal system, an explanation of how, how it worked. And they were just silent afterwards. And one guy just said, that's chaos. And I think, you know, in terms of um, restrictions, I would say the way that y you divvy up tax is perhaps the first restriction and the second one is how and this is the point that you're getting at I think is is looking at tax as a lever in and of itself so not just seeing it primarily as a revenue raising but also as a means of as it's indicative of some of the challenges the structural challenges in our economy as well so you know, particularly around um, non-participation and the percentage of Scottish adults that don't even earn enough, earn above uh, 12,500, so are, are not paying tax. And that if a certain percentage of them would earn just, you know, £5,000 more, they would pay X 
Now that is, that goes to the heart of equality and issues around uh, poverty and how we support, how we ensure that we have a, a workforce that is contributing to wider society. So I think using income tax as a, as a mirror to understand some of the structural challenges in the Scottish economy around participation and uh, around other issues it is quite useful and you can apply that to the, the other end of the spectrum yeah. as well in terms of the, the top. Okay and it's and slightly taking a slightly different spin on that because we talked talked earlier about um, I fully appreciate your message there about you know the Scottish government is not controlling the income side but has the purse to spend and, and a couple of questions coming in because of course we've got we've got many many chartered accountants who love the numbers on this and and we talked earlier about dialogue so I've got a couple of two or three questions here which kind of come to the same theme as um this taking away the political spin if we can because I can appreciate how things are presented but um confusion about how much additional money through COVID-19 is Scotland really getting because on the same day in announcements we can hear different views from the UK yeah. government the Scottish government now we all know numbers are numbers but um, you know, we've got a lot of chartered accounts here and saying, well, I'm hearing that, that COVID-19 benefit to Scotland additional was X, and the Scottish yeah. government will say why. Yeah. So how, do you how do you reconcile that? It's really simple, but you've got to understand the way that the devolution settlement works. So at the Chancellor's summer budget update, there were three main numbers that you needed to know. One, is the fact that most of his economic interventions were UK-wide. Now, I may not like that, but it's just a fact, right? I'm just presenting that. That was a fact, because VAT is reserved, and a number of the other uh, things he, he did was, was reserved. So SDLT is obviously not reserved, so there's, there's budgetary implications. So um, Scotland, Scottish businesses, this country, our economy, will clearly benefit from UK-wide initiatives, okay? And in terms of the figures, that's very difficult to put a figure on because a lot of it's demand-led. So the kickstart scheme and the, the, the whatever they're calling it, the, the furlough bonus, um, that will be demand-led. So I don't have figures there for you in terms of what Scotland will benefit. There's another figure, which is, what is the cumulative sum of what money what consequentials have gone to Scotland to cover all of our COVID interventions so the primary one there and that's where your 800 million comes from which was front page of the Daily Mail that is based on uh, essentially what consequentials we got from the UK government spending on PPE PPE was the biggest driver in that there was a few other bits and pieces uh, the vast majority all bar 27 million of that 800 million had been previously announced. So it wasn't new to us and it didn't have much to do with the economy. Um, I'm very grateful for it. I'm very grateful that the UK government confirmed what we will get in consequentials for PPE. But it has nothing to do with the economic interventions. And that was a summer economic update. So again, it was just some, uh, it was a sum of the last. The figure that got the big attention was 21 million pounds. Now, you can choose to believe me or not. I actually didn't think that it was a radical point to make, which I made by a tweet, that of the 30 billion pounds, the Scottish government, not the Scottish country, not Scottish business, not the Scottish economy, the Scottish government would only get 21 million pounds, uh, which I said was, was, was less than, was about 0.1%. And that's because, you'll know the figures, that's because all the capital, pretty much all the capital, was just redeployed. It was just underspends in one place or choices being made to, to redeploy it. And we will only ever get consequentials and new spend. We don't get consequentials when money's just moving around. So that 21 million related to a few, um, it was actually through Department of Education where they had uh, received money in order to support some of the kickstart and apprenticeship schemes, so we would get 21 million pounds. But this is where independent, respectable voices are so key, because the next morning on Good Morning Scotland radio programme, no offence to the presenter, but the figures get, kept getting all muddled together, which is Scottish businesses are getting 800 million pounds. How does that tally with 21 million? Well, no, 
Scottish businesses will get funding. We're getting funding on PPE, but on the economy, economic interventions, it was 21 million. Okay. Well, that, that, that was a very good reconciliation, so thank you for that. Um, so turning just back a bit to, well, COVID-19 discussion in terms of kind of coming out of it. And I've got a couple of questions here from, from people in business, um, really saying, you know, when, when, when are we going to see businesses open? Because the clarification between a non-essential office and a call centre, ICAS is working remotely and, and we're fine with it. But for some people, um, certainly it becomes harder and harder. And, and I fully appreciate we're, we're balancing health issues with getting the economy going. But, but there's a couple of questions here saying, as we diverge more with, with what's happening in England and Wales, are we finding ourselves at a competitive disadvantage by not being as open for business in a regular fashion? So three quick questions on that, and I'll take the last one first and then come on to the route map around non-essential offices. I think that firstly, the divergence has been overstated. So if you look at, if you take one industry as an example, let's take tourism, that's been very vocal and uh, understandably um, very hard hit by COVID. Now, for a long time, they were lobbying for a date by which they were to reopen and they got the 15th of June. Now, it was about two weeks after the rest of the UK reopened, um, which actually, even when they had a date, hotels north and south of the border are saying that whilst they're grateful for the date, that does not guarantee the return of customers because what customers and consumers need is confidence. And they need confidence in safety measures. They need confidence that they are willing to put themselves at, at risk, for example, in order to, uh, to, to access a service or access a product. And so I think, particularly if you look at uh, most of our internal economic analysis in terms of the, the economic impact in Scotland, I mean, it's very, very similar and it's very, it's relatively aligned for all that my, I might say politically Scotland's doing a, a better job. That, that's, the, the figures clearly show that the economic impact is relatively similar north and south of the border. And I think this fixation with dates reopening, getting a date to reopen is key and businesses need certainty. More than that, customers, consumers, the market needs confidence. In terms of non-essential offices, one of the things that we've had to weigh up, and this goes to my point around harms, is that if you look at each individual element of the route map, so if you look at uh, like hotels, if you look at non-essential offices, if you look at each of those things, in and of themselves, the, the impact on the rate of infection or the R number might be minimal, it might be manageable. But we're never looking at things in isolation. We are looking at it holistically. And people want to see their family again, they want to see friends, they want to have a quality of life, they may want to get back to uh, sports or, or the gym. They also want to perhaps go into the office, restart their business. They also have perhaps hobbies on the side. They also want to ensure that there's other health services available, being able to you know, get cancer treatment and, and get checkups done. We have to look at it holistically and when you, and, and each, stage of the route map we have tried to ensure that we are dealing with each of the harms in turn and not just focusing exclusively on either the health harm or exclusively on the economic harm so you may well have been able to open more businesses earlier on by not allowed it, not allowing people that were shielding for so long out but i mean those people have been shielding for a long time and the, the harm the health harm the wider health harm the mental health harm on them is profound. So that's what we've had to, to balance up. And where there's other alternative options that are not causing as much harm, we have tried to delay them longer. Okay, now I'm gonna change tack here because we do have some technical questions coming in more around taxation and policies. And um, so one, there's, there's been quite a lot of media debate in the last week or so about capital gains tax. Um, and and uh, certainly, a bit of a theme is capital gains tax going to help pay off some of the COVID-19 debt by changes there. Any thoughts on if you had a if you had your own magic wand with capital gains tax, how would you see that feature or change it? 
Yeah, and, and obviously we don't have a uh, power, but I think the focus is increasingly on wealth taxes, isn't it? The focus is, is really shifted onto to wealth and uh, tax uh, in that way. And I think the Chancellor has um, pulled quite a number of surprises out of the hat in the last short while, unexpectedly so. And I don't know what he will do on tax, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did move more on wealth taxes and uh, did more on, on capital gains. I think the bottom line to all of this is that we're running out of options. So in terms mm. of revenue, if we collectively as a country want to continue to see financial interventions on the level that we have seen, then we're running out of options in order to do that. So I think we'll have to take increasingly novel options. I think too, that some have done extremely well through the crisis. Some businesses have done extremely well, particularly tech, digital, Amazon, for want of a better word. And I think even more than capital gains tax, people will be focusing very much on those that have, those businesses that have come out the other end with significant, vastly significant, huge, astronomical uh, mm. uh, um, uh, um, uh, improvements. Okay, and just keeping on that theme of additional income, and it's not income per se, because it's different. You, you've spoken often quite loudly about additional borrowing powers or change in the criteria. So, and I do distinguish, because you, you have distinguished between the criteria. Um, yeah. I suppose the worry from some one or two says, well, well, if Scotland borrows more, do we just not store up a problem for tomorrow? So it's a legitimate point. And I don't, you can't talk about borrowing without recognising that borrowing is not free money. It's, it's, it's something that you've got to manage in the coming years. The point I keep making is that these are extraordinary times. If there was ever a time to intervene and save business, if there was ever a point to ensure that otherwise viable businesses continue to employ hundreds of people or otherwise see those people depend on the welfare state, this is a time for extraordinary interventions. And I think that's the approach the UK government has taken. And I would say that the lack of flexibility for the Scottish government has directly hindered our ability to move as quickly and to do as radical interventions as perhaps were, were, were called for. So that's, that's the point that I'm, I'm making. Now, as you rightly said, I do draw a distinction between what I'm calling for and what I might otherwise quite like to have. What I'm calling for is for the borrowing powers to make sense in a pandemic. So we can borrow some capital, we can borrow capital up to a limit of 450 million pounds. We can borrow revenue for essentially two purposes. One is to manage cash flow, not a power I need. It's just not a power I need. We can also borrow for a forecast error. Although, fascinatingly, the limit of the borrowing for forecast error is 300 million, and next year's reconciliation is about just under 600 million. So there's a problem there. Um, in the absence of, of those powers, I am still dependent on, as it were, a very fixed pie. And mm -hmm. the only way I can increase money on PPE is to take it from business grants. The only way I can support you know, businesses more is by taking it away from nurses' salaries, that kind of thing, because it's a, a fixed budget. So we, I've not asked for increasing the limits. I've asked for the borrowing powers to be used for the for the pandemic rather than for purposes I don't need them for. Okay, and, and I'm going to change things again slightly because I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the, some of the answers to this, but I've asked a couple of times here. So in your remit and in, in previous committee work you've done, you've been quite focused on the digital economy. And, and frankly, we've all seen, you know, many of us wonder if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, how would we have managed given, given we're even having this conversation with 200 people just now. Um, how how do we how do you take the resource that Scotland's got and really fire up the digital economy that, that we know and particularly you being a rural MSP fundamental to the islands etc. Yeah, 
Absolutely. One positive is I think that our digital infrastructure has fared better than we might have feared. I think it's been quite impressive. But on that, this is an issue, a, a question I have grappled with for a few years now because we in this country have had long-standing challenges with productivity. And I see the digital economy as one of the primary means of resolving our productivity challenge. But if you look at digital adoption across the board, it's very poor and it's very low in Scotland. And in the past, we have tried things like providing funding for digital adoption and the take up has been very low. And I think that's because businesses haven't recognized the need for it. COVID's changed that. COVID has demonstrated that the businesses that were able to move online or have more efficient ways of doing things are the businesses that have uh, been as successful as possible. And so I think that part of the argument, seeing the value of it, perhaps has finally turned a corner. And so we've got to, in the next few months and years, we've got to back our winning industries. And for me, our tech industry is the industry of the future. We know that tech is forecast to be the fastest growing sector in Scotland by 2024, or at least it was before COVID. I can assume that that, that, not, that year has been brought forward. And therefore, our resources have got to be deployed to back that, that winning industry. And that, that's, that's right across the board. That's education. That's ensuring that we're funding university and college places to produce uh, the skills that we need. That's uh, providing the, the, the startup funding and the scale up funding and working in collaboration with, with business um, and attracting a uh, private sector investment. And I've got um, Mark Logan, who's the former chief operating mm -hmm. officer of Skyscanner, doing a paper for me just now, a review of the tech ecosystem he's due to publish soon. And it's a brilliant report. It's very practical, very tangible for, for how we do this holistically, again, from education through to your, your, your unicorns. Okay, and just staying on digital, I'm trying to find the question because it quoted numbers, but it said of about 230 million additional spend coming to the, to the business, about 35 million allocated to digital. Where is that being spent? Is that, does that, that 230 million, does that relate to my ca the capital underspend figures? I think so, and, and, and I think the quote is, you mentioned 230 million and 35 million being specifically allocated to digital. How, how will that be spent? Okay, so I think, that, I think that relates to our early, early stage growth scheme. So this yeah. was a scheme, there's three elements to it, and I'll go into detail, but it yeah, was... It's within the, uh, I've got it quoted here, in the returns to work package of 230 yeah. million. Yeah, yeah so, um, uh, so um, I've, got, yeah, I've got the figures here. So the, that relates to three elements. So there's three elements. It was focused on the fact that, um, particularly startups, and high growth companies had perhaps lost overnight some of their potential private investment. So it focused on three particular areas. One, it was in grants for sort of pre-seed businesses. Uh, there was an early growth challenge fund. So the, the pre-seed uh, businesses um, would, was targeting grants of about 50,000 pounds and they were on pre-seed spin out projects that could commercialize uh, tech emerging from Scottish unis and research institutes and also NHS boards as well to try and support um, highly innovative uh, um, high growth companies and we would expect about 30 to 40 uh, businesses and about 8 to 10 university spin outs to, to benefit from that. The second one was on early stage growth challenge fund and that's a competitive process and it's basically to ensure support is on uh, best prospects and it supports growth activity uh, where funds have been diverted away because of the additional costs of uh, COVID. Um, and the last one was related to um, it's a co-investment co scheme, it's an equity co-investment scheme. And it's an extension of a scheme that we've already got in place through the Scottish Investment Bank. So the Scottish Investment Bank has been making equity co-investments since about 2003 to, to grow our early stage uh, risk capital uh, by getting in private investment. So that additional, there's additional 10 million on that. Um, extends the reach and the impact. So that is the, that's the 33 million. Okay, and turning to more macro questions again. So we've got two or three coming in here about um, 
size and scale matters when you've got a pandemic. So the direct question is, are we not in a better position for being part of the UK with that strong balance sheet when you go through a crisis like this? And does this demonstrate we should stay part of the UK given you're in a political party that doesn't see that? So the message being the financial strength of the UK is being demonstrated its importance right now. So that is going to be the central question of mm -hmm. the next few months, in my humble opinion. Yeah. And that goes right to the heart of the constitutional debate. Now, well, that's why I had to ask you it, because the, oh, yeah, the, the, the members are asking. It's a good question. It's an absolutely yeah. good question. And I would I, I'd respond in two ways. The first is to be really clear, and I have tried very hard at every point to be constructive, because uh, I think people are fed up with political arguments, but to be constructive any news channel, any radio interview to thank the UK government for what it's, what it's done in terms of furlough scheme. Um, but I think there's a real problem with British exceptionalism and there's a real problem in assuming that the strong arms of the union have been the only place and way to uh, support um, our people. And actually right across the board, across Europe, you see variations on a theme you see different uh, ways of, of doing things. You see small countries that are just the same size as Scotland uh, doing very similar things and sometimes protecting uh, workers and ensuring that there's a, a welfare net that's stronger than the UK. So this notion of exceptionalism where the UK is the only place that is able to secure funding in order to put in place a furlough scheme, I don't think is, is factually accurate. Now, we have in the last few months tried to work constructively with the UK government, but I've just mentioned one way in terms of limited borrowing powers. Mm -hmm. There's other flexibilities that I've called for, uh, which would make a huge difference to, to Scotland. And those requests have just been point blank ignored. And most of the requests won't cost the Treasury anything. They won't make a difference to the Treasury. One of the most obvious ways is being able to use some of our capital underspend for revenue purposes. But there's such rigid, arcane, nonsensical rules limiting the fiscal framework and the way that we can use our powers that I would say we're hamstrung and we're doing it with one hand tied behind our back. Now, if we had the kind of relationship where Treasury said, do you know what? You've made a good case. That makes sense. Let's work with you to ensure that uh, Scotland can use its powers, not to secure independence in this case, but literally just to be able to fund the most basic interventions in our economy, in our health service, then that might be different. But at the moment, it's, here's the furlough scheme. That's all you need. We're very grateful for it, very grateful for it. But I don't buy the argument, the British exceptionalist argument, that this is the only place where it's happened nor do I buy the argument that it's all been rosy gardens because I think that it take for a constructive relationship you need both parties to be willing to work together to help one another and despite the most constructive approach that I can muster certainly in private some of these really basic uh, simple flexibilities haven't haven't been delivered not to my cost but to the cost of Scottish business and Scottish society. And, and, I suppose, and I do thank you for taking that question head on, but I suppose listening to that, I'm slightly disappointed, not, not in your response at all, and, um, but more in that at a time like this, we really need governments, people with the levers to have constructive dialogue and a maturity of conversation. And I suppose many people on this call, you know, they've got, they're either in business, they're a finance director or they're in practice and they're managing other people's businesses, but giving advice. And um, it's kind of, I think we'd all agree, it's not a time for scoring points. It's about mature conversations to get things done. Yeah. And, and, and so how, how do you improve that dialogue that, that therefore we all benefit? Yeah. Three ways. One, and I'm not perfect, but from the very beginning, we have tried to be very constructive. So, you know, for all that I might say in, in public, I have regular conversations with my counterparts in Treasury. And in fact, I'm seeing the Chief Secretary on Friday in person. So those conversations are very constructive. And particularly on my asks around fiscal flexibilities, it's usually 
that's very interesting, but I can't give you an answer now. And the difficulty is that you can have very constructive conversations in private. They never actually make it into the public domain. Yeah. So um, I think that's one thing. Secondly, dialogue, dialogue has to deliver. Dialogue has to actually deliver change. Uh, and dialogue on its own basis won't ever deliver change. And this is, um, it, there's no way around it. This is a, a strange setup. It is a very unequal setup where you've got three devolved governments all with different levels of power. And then you've got a UK government and England doesn't really have its own devolved uh, level. So there's a real problem, I think, in the way that this has all evolved, which is a very disjointed system. So I think you need to really tackle the, the structural issues. And then the, the third point I would make is how important it is, again, going back to my point, that independent, respected voices have a say in all of these debates. And it's political arguments and rammies that will make the front pages. Mm -hmm. That won't make the difference to the small businesses. What will make the small what, what will make the difference is is the, the thoughtful, constructive contributions. And again, on my asks, there was three fiscal flexibilities I made asks for. I've told you about switching capital to revenue, uh, limited borrowing powers. I could have used that as a political point scoring. So I could have gone in and made demands about um, the Scottish government or, or Scotland being independent. I didn't. I used the most narrow, limited powers I needed. Built cross-party support, so Labour, Lib Dems and the Greens support it. Independent think tanks have supported these calls. So there's a coalition trying to move it beyond just Scottish Government and UK Government at loggerheads and try to take it into a place where we're actually debating the merits of the idea mm. rather than Scotland's constitutional future. And that is nearly impossible to do, I would suggest, in the public domain on the front pages of newspapers. But if you look beyond the front pages of the newspapers, yeah. there is that work going on. Okay, and, and I'm pleased you mentioned small businesses there and SMEs because um, I, I don't rightly or wrongly, there, there is a perception and it kind of, and, and it gets referred to in the Benny Higgins work, um, you know, that, that government is fixated on policies, et cetera, but doesn't really have a dialogue with businesses. And I, I think the, the report quotes actually, well, it takes two sides to have a dialogue. Uh, what's your views on that? I mean, what, what and, and, and also taking your point, it's not just about dialogue, it's about actions. How do we, how do we improve the interaction between government and business in, in Scotland? Yeah, so I think it's about moving beyond the dialogue. So every day for the last four months, there has been daily discussions with business organisations, business representation, rep business representative organisations. On a constituency basis, I have phone calls, emails galore from, from businesses. Lots of discussion. I think what the Benny Higgins report gets to is how we move beyond the dialogue and actually work in partnership with each other. And I started my short speech by talking about this national endeavour. And again, it's cliched, but it's the only way we're going to get through the next few months. And that's where I think government needs to work with business, not hinder business, support business, because ultimately it's not government that's employing people, it's gonna be business that employs people, pays their wages, allows them to put food on the table. And we need to look, I think, for a few big examples where we can do that better, where we're not just talking about ideas, but we're actually working in partnership to achieve, uh, to achieve something. Okay. Now I'm conscious of time, so I, and, and we have many questions which we just haven't got to, and I've probably focused maybe too much on the macro. What I was going to suggest at the end, Kate, if you were willing, we would pass the questions to you, and if you so choose, you could come back to us because we do like to encourage people to ask questions, and we can email them off to you, and feel free to come back, and we can share them as you see fit. Um, because I've tried to keep it quite wide, but a couple of questions just to finish on and right back to the beginning, you, you mentioned ethics. So somebody's asked the question, um, do you think we should get ethics into the school curriculum? Because it's not really mentioned even at school or particularly at universities. 
Yes would be the short answer, but I two other points. One is I think we believe the answer to everything is just shove it in the school curriculum. And there's mm. a point there. But we put an enormous burden on teachers to teach everything from Chinese to ethics to, you know, and, and they're all important, absolutely important issues. And I think with ethics, there is a role there to teach it. But more than that, there's a role for, um, for, for weaving it into everything else that we do. So, mm. you know, one of the, the merits of curriculum for education, uh, for excellence rather, is that it tried to move away from just simple outcomes in terms of exam marks and moved it into values. Uh, that's very difficult to quantify, really difficult to quantify. Um, and there's plenty of debate about the curriculum for excellence. But what it was trying to do is weave things like ethics through every, every, everything else so that you actually end up with well-rounded, honest, kind children. Mm. Okay. Schools can't do that alone. I think there's a role for, um, obviously for families more than anything else. Uh, but I think it's really unfortunate too that ethics is, is, is something that we talk a lot about, but who cares if people talk about it if they don't see it and you need to be able to yeah. see it and, and look and look to find role models in society that you say i can follow that person yeah okay now one one very human question and then i'm going to throw it over to you to leave some thoughts with us but somebody has obviously read or knows that the first minister relaxes through covid19 by reading books what does kate forbes do to relax and forget about covid19 she never relaxes no um i decided that last weekend I was going to try snorkeling in the frigid freezing Atlantic off the coast of Applecross and uh, it was great highly recommended get a good wetsuit and it was a lot of fun um, I a thick wetsuit then it was a very thick <laughs> wetsuit and, and my ears are still cold uh, being outdoors and uh, getting into mountains or um, some long distance walks, that would be my approach, would be to, to get outside and, and get active. Okay, well that's also a very good advert for staycations as we're all enjoying our own country and it's not such a bad thing after all, is it? I think we've all been reminded that there's an awful lot of beauty on our doorsteps. Indeed, lots of midges as well. Yes, we know that, we know that, we've got our share. Um, so final thoughts, we, we, I'd just like to thank you. you. You have been very open, very honest. Um, you haven't ducked a single question and you haven't even gone into Gaelic to fool us all. Not all, because there are one or two people on this call would really know what you were saying. Um, but just, just over to you for the, the last minute. If there was three things you want to leave with us to think about, what would they be? One, what role are you going to play in this national endeavour over, over the next few few? weeks. It's easy to blame government for getting it wrong, but if it's going to be a national endeavour, what role do we all play in that? I think secondly, eh, raise your voices, your independent, respected voices. Take part where you can in debates about the future, policy, taxation, the upcoming budget. Um, and then thirdly, eh, keep building bridges. You know, these, these three points are very government oriented, but keep building bridges to uh, government because we need your advice, we need your guidance, we need your thoughts, we need your scrutiny and your holding us accountable. And I think that's three points that I'd be keen to leave with you in terms of our relationship. Well, that, that was a lovely way to sum up. Kate, I'd just like to say a big thank you on behalf of the 200 odd people here. I apologize to those we haven't asked the questions. We'll pass the questions to you and, and see if you want to come back on any of them. We can share them entirely up to you. But Kate, thank you for your time. It's not as if you're not very busy. Um, no problem. I've certainly enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure the 200 silent witnesses to the conversation have enjoyed it too. So Great. thank Thanks you all so for much. listening and a big thank you to you, Kate. Thank you. Thanks. Talk to you later.